Maya Ejmera is the founder and president of Global Fund for Children, an organization dedicated to helping underprivileged children around the world. As I was writing this presentation, I received an email from Maya reporting that Global Fund for Children awarded 518 grants in 2007, valued at more than $3.1 million. $3.1 million may not sound like a lot of money these days, but you would be amazed at what it can buy in India. I met Maya at the home of a friend who had the splendid good sense to choose a wealthy father. Her life's work, in addition to raising her family, has been to administer the family's philanthropic organizations, including Global Fund for Children. I explained to Maya that while I didn't have money to donate, I did have a burning desire to do something meaningful with my photography. Maya described a number of organizations in India that needed photographs for website development and fundraising purposes. I chose to work on two of these projects, as well as a project for the Tibetan Nuns Project in Dharamsala during my six weeks in India. Today it is indeed gratifying to see my photographs on the websites of all of these organizations. The first project I worked on was for Salam Balak Trust in Delhi. Mira Nair founded Salam Balak Trust in 1989. She's the Oscar-nominated film director of Slum Bombay, Mississippi Masala, and most recently, Hysterical Blindness. Mrs. Nair created Salam Balak Trust as a means of rehabilitating the street children who acted in Salam Bombay. Today, Mrs. Nair's mother, Praveen Nair, who the children call the Madonna of Delhi, oversee Salam Balak Trust. It was an honor meeting Praveen Nair and documenting the work she and her staff are accomplishing in drop-in shelters, non-formal education, vocational training, medical and psychological care, and in rare cases, formal education. Salam Balak Trust is located on the fourth floor of a rather dilapidated warehouse close to the main railroad station in a pretty sketchy part of Delhi. By the time I made my way from my hotel to Salam Balak Trust, I was sweaty and disheveled, which was completely understandable, since the air was stifling and the temperature was close to 100 degrees before noon. I was immediately struck by the contrast of the rather dilapidated surroundings and Mrs. Nair, an elegant woman with perfectly coiffed white hair dressed in a beautiful pale green kameez tunic. She seemed impervious to the heat, no doubt conditioned by a lifetime of living in India. Delhi attracts thousands of runaway, orphaned, and homeless children every year, most of them boys. Whether coming in search of employment or escaping abusive family situations, these children find themselves begging for money and food, sleeping on the streets, and falling prey to violence, crime, sexual exploitation, and substance abuse. Most of them arrive at the main Delhi railroad station. Praveen Nair has built Salam Balak Trust into an organization of over 80 professionals, including PhD psychologists, volunteer physicians, teachers, and social workers. She told me that it's her goal to institutionalize Salam Balak Trust before she dies so that her work will live on. At age 80, she looks beautiful and works hours that would stress a woman half her age. I was immediately in awe of Mrs. Nyer, and it became clear that her staff shared my feelings. She assigned a young social worker named Satush to accompany me, and he stuck to me like glue while I documented the work of Salam Balak Trust. Satush made it possible for me to meet people and visit places I otherwise would have never experienced. The first project Shatush and I worked on was a platform school, so named because the children are taught where they live, on the railroad station platform of the main Delhi train station. Mrs. Nair explained to me that runaways are suspicious of adults and hesitate to leave the relative security of the platform to go to school, and they have every right to be leery. During the week I worked with the boys at the platform school, the dismembered bodies of two children were found stuffed into a garbage can at the railroad station. 
I remember thinking at the time that I didn't have adequate emotions to know how to deal with something that horrific. And I'm a mature woman rather than a vulnerable child. So Salam Balak Trust comes to the children. The children I met, all boys, varied with regard to age, ethnicity, apparent health, and attitude towards me, this very jet-lagged and no doubt strange-looking white woman from America. Some of the boys were clearly sick, while others appeared to be well-fed and healthy. Some were indifferent to my camera and me, while others clearly felt my presence to be an intrusion. In addition to children, the platform school also taught a young retarded man who seemed totally accepted by the boys. Boys of all ages were using educational materials that looked to be suitable for the average kindergarten in the United States. I will never again take for granted the educational opportunity most American children enjoy, however imperfect. All of the boys were attentive to their teacher and worked quietly and diligently on their assignments. It was only when their noontime meal arrived and after their prayers that I observed laughter and friendly banter. The boys enjoy a simple vegetarian meal served out of a big metal canister. It looked good to me and I was really hungry, but I couldn't justify sharing their food since for most it's the only meal of the day. After a few days, the boys warmed to my presence, especially when I let them turn the camera on me. Just before leaving the platform school for the final time, I photographed Chatouche counseling a young man who was clearly strung out on drugs. Chatouche's empathy, encouragement, and non-judgmental body language made a lasting impression on me. Afterward, Chatouche asked me to photograph a group of boys milling about the entrance to the railroad station parking lot. He explained that these young boys were prostitutes and drug addicts who he'd been trying to recruit to Salon Block Trust. But these boys opted for a life on the streets, their decision no doubt fueled by the lure of drugs. Later that day, Chatush took me on a long walk up the railroad tracks to visit another Salon Block Trust school, this one situated just a few feet from the tracks, where children played ball with a can and a stick. I couldn't help but reflect on my own son's plethora of expensive sporting goods equipment. I was pleased to see girls attended this school as well as boys. On the way back to the railroad station, we came upon a young girl washing her beautifully colored basket of clothes. I wondered why this young girl wasn't at the Salon Block Trot School just up the tracks. My question was answered when she proudly retrieved her baby son from the hut where she lives. The baby looked to be about 18 months old. Once again, I needed to adjust my preconceived notions about what is normal. Things are very different along the train tracks in Delhi. After completing the platform school photography, I asked if it might be possible to meet with Mrs. Nair again. I asked her, how do you do it? There are so many. I feel completely overwhelmed. She smiled knowingly and said that you just try to save one life at a time. Then she told me the story of a 12-year-old little girl who was surviving on the streets as a prostitute. Salam Balak Trust gave her a safe place to live and learn. Today she operates her own tailoring shop in Delhi. It's no stretch to believe that Mrs. Nair and Salam Balak Trust literally saved the life of this young girl. Then she told me about Shatush. She found him when he was a young runaway living on the streets of Delhi. Chatouche is one of the very lucky ones, since he's very bright and was able to take advantage of not only vocational training, but also formal education. Today he lives in his own apartment with his wife and son, and he works as a social worker with Salam Balak Trust. All of a sudden his empathy, encouragement, and non-judgmental body language made more sense, as did his dedication to Salam Balak Trust. Salon Block Trust also provides vocational training to those boys who have the basic skills to learn computer technology and tailoring. And just like the platform school, these boys re receive a hearty noontime vegetarian meal. Between classes, the boys sat on mats and played games. Most of the boys appeared to be vaguely curious about me, but mostly they were focused on the computer monitors. They listened intently to their teacher and rarely looked up. 
but there was one boy who stared unflinchingly at me most of the time. His cross-eyed stare made me slightly uncomfortable. I wasn't sure which eye to look at, so I took refuge behind my camera. I've only experienced this kind of unperturbed staring from small children who have not yet learned society's notion of acceptable eye contact and personal space. The first line of defense for Salon Balak Trust are drop-in shelters, where boys under the age of 18 are encouraged to live during the day. At night, they return to the streets to fend for themselves. The shelter Shatush took me to consisted of a plastic tarp-covered room with a few cots and a blanket on the ground. I found the room crowded with boys and several of the teachers I'd seen earlier working with Mrs. Nyer. Once again, the boys varied in age, ethnicity, and apparent health. One little boy couldn't have been more than four years old. He waved his cut finger right in front of my face, looking for a little attention, or perhaps a little pity like any normal four-year-old would. The only difference was that this four-year-old lived on the streets of Delhi. The older teenage boys commandeered the few cots. Some of the boys seemed agitated, while others appeared inexplicably content. Some were sick or at least malnourished, while others appeared to be in good physical condition. I can't even imagine the psychological state of these young children who make their home on the streets. The purpose of the drop-in shelter is to get the children off the streets. Here they find a safe place to spend the day. Trained teachers and social workers see to the children's basic medical and nutritional needs, but education is pretty much limited to playing games. My visit was greeted as a welcome diversion. All of the boys were anxious to peer into my lens with their huge brown eyes. I found my new digital SLR to be the perfect tool to break down barriers, since all of the boys marveled at my ability to instantly create their image. It was for some of the boys the first time they'd ever seen their photograph. For the children, my camera was an amazing toy. For me, it was an invaluable tool to cross social, economic, ginger, and age barriers.